Because the further you take that work, the more you beg the question, do you want to do something about it? Are we then talking about perhaps trying to adjust levels We're of testosterone in the womb? We're not doing research with a view to starting to tinker with hormone levels, playing God, as it were, to see whether if you change the child's hormone levels in the womb, you know, does that change their brain development? What is certain from the work of scientists such as Professor Baron Cohen and Francesca Happe is that autism is in the genes. We're also in the process of studying a large sample of twins who actually meet diagnostic criteria for autism. At the present, they're around 12, 14 years old. And this is work funded by the Medical Research Council to try and better understand the nature and nurture contributions to autism. The research to date shows that autism is very highly heritable, that is, very strongly affected by genes. There's a lot more to autism than DNA, but it's this that concerned Chris Goodchild when he became a parent. He's on the lookout for any sign that his nine-year-old son may have inherited the condition he calls a painful gift. As an adopted child, he tracked down his natural father, only to find they shared what he later discovered were autistic traits. In many ways, I could see myself, but without my facade or cloak of normality, and it terrified me. The man looked like Rasputin, incredibly long hair, unwashed, in a pair of underpants and a sheet wrapped around him and, and, and cobwebs on the sheet. And we got into his room. He's a hoarder, so there was hoarding to the ceiling. And it drove me even further underground to try and be nothing like him at all, because it was kind of everything I was trying to keep in the closet. His father has never been diagnosed. But as Chris grew older, he needed to know why he felt so different. When I set off for the evaluation, which was in Preston, I knew I wouldn't be coming back the same person. If I was to be told I didn't have Asperger's syndrome, I know that I would have killed myself because I couldn't bear any longer this cloud of unknowing. I was recommended to be put on an antidepressant soon after the diagnosis, but I was keen to come off it so I could experience for the first time in my life living a life consciously as a person with Asperger's syndrome. I feel like I'm still dealing with the aftershocks of that diagnosis because I really have to look back at everything from a new perspective, like I might have been colourblind and not known it. I can't read most human expressions. I don't understand most of the intricacies of human social behaviour. I don't like it, I don't want to do a lot of the things that other people do. That's quite a template to put over one's whole life and re-examine. Support for adult autistics is at last high on the government's agenda. A nationwide strategy born out of recent consultations could promise people with autism fuller lives, with better diagnosis and support for adults, employment opportunities and training for professionals. So last time... What did we talk about in the first session? Situations, didn't we? So what we Groups like this, what you find using difficult? cognitive behaviour well, therapy to help develop social skills, should become more widely available. So we talked about the situations that aren't great, that you have, you know, that really upset you and you find... I'm Bettina Stotts. I'm the resource centre manager for the Surrey Autism Resource Centre. We see a lot of adults who aren't diagnosed, who can't get a diagnosis, but who clearly are on the autism spectrum or we see those that have been misdiagnosed in the past. We see a lot of dual diagnosis. So sometimes we get people who have five labels. It's these labels that can obscure the individual, especially in some of the more sensitive areas of relationships. The area, I suppose, that fascinates me the most is sexuality. It's an aspect about autism spectrum disorder that is still so much taboo. When I was about 25 and uh, had my first serious relationship, I realised that um, I was deeply distressed and anxious. I never allowed someone to get that close before. There are quite a few women who have never had sex at all. There are others who might be quite predatory because they enjoy having sex, but don't necessarily understand the sort of implications of doing that type of thing. And there are women who are extremely vulnerable. I had no sense of who I was and and had to take care of myself. All I knew was I was starting to do things like this. <laughs> Ticking noises. And I was starting to become very obsessive, compulsive. And it was 
totally distressing. It took me, I thought, goodness, I, I'm feeling like I felt when I was a child again. What's going on? I couldn't handle with the enormity of intimacy and closeness. The kind of social interaction that so many of us neurotypicals take for granted is something that has to be learned. Session two, we talked about emotions in particular, didn't we? About our feelings. So it's the sort of the thinking type feelings rather than the physical. Um, helping somebody feelings. communicate, discover about themselves, being able to tell other people can have a huge impact on, on people's lives. I think most people will tell you that their self-esteem has improved, that for the first time in their lives they have made friends. And we have people now who understand that they're not the only one in the whole world that is like that. For David and Cara, who met at the social skills group, there's a happy ending. They're planning to get married. Me and Cara sort of get on because we're on the same wavelength and stuff. We like the same things and think the same way. Our brains are sort of in harmony with each other as well. Also, our emotions are the same. Because, like, we have the same sense of humour. You see a lot of people with Asperger's syndrome that try so hard, just so hard, to be a part of the human race. But the fact is, is often they're seen as being somehow not human or they don't have souls or they don't have feelings. We do. We can love, but we just love differently. Professor Hape is also keen for society to see autism in a far more positive light. I feel enormously optimistic about the future for people on the autism spectrum. The technological, the information age we live in is very suited to many people at the high end of the autism spectrum. If you imagine that many people with autism have a fantastic eye for detail, can understand in Simon Baron Cohen's ideas of systemizing, can understand how systems work, can you be an expert in computer science and other sciences, or even maybe now in engineering, who knows, even if you work on your own, just you and your computer screen, yes, you can. Moving through the making of this program has brought quite a few discoveries. I'd never realized just how remarkable many adult autistics are. Some have IQs in the top 2% of the population. Others have special talents, music, maths and more. But often society doesn't give all this the credit it deserves. We fail to recognize strengths. We're not always good at accommodating weaknesses. I think the real challenge for the future is that we raise awareness, especially among employers, of the difficulties but also the strengths in autism to allow people, including people with not such intellectual capacity but many special areas of ability and interest, to harness that potential. Any journey by bus, train or car with a companion like Chris Payne is an education. Chris can't bath himself or cook a meal, but his detailed, faultless knowledge of bus routes is frequently put to good use. Companies ask him to train their drivers. Follow my nose, just go follow my nose. I found a new route to go on, Newton Airport to Milton Keynes. That's what I'll do, and then I'll, when I get to Milton Keynes, I'll probably get the X4, which goes up to Northampton from Milton Keynes. Why, Chris? Just for the ride, they're double deckers, a nice double decker. I go upstairs and I sample the views at huh, the top. It's the travelling I like, yes. Just trying to find my way home. My world's under glass. Playgrounds as battlefields and life is but a stage after all. Adults with Autism was presented by Mike Embley. The producer was Sarah Parker. It was a White Pebble media production for BBC Radio 4.